This is the equivalent to particle physics as any major sports stadium is to any big sporting event in Britain. Wimbledon is to tennis. In Australia, the Sydney Opera House is to singing and you know, this is where it's at. It looks a little run down actually, doesn't it? I think what we're seeing here is that they've focused their attention on the experiments <laughs> and that the people who are working on the experiments and doing the day-to-day -day investigations, well, they can survive with the, the odd 1960s, 1950s building that seems to have rust above the windows. <laughs> looks like it might be leaking a little bit. CERN's way bigger than the Large Hadron Collider and in fact it, it dates back to just after the Second World War, the first ideas for a European, major European research lab to look at the fundamental structures of matter. De Genève, le prix Nobel de physique, Monsieur Félix Bloch, a présidé la cérémonie de la pose de la première pierre de l'Institut Européen pour la recherche nucléaire. And it was at a time when Europe was still recovering from the Second World War uh, things were developing in the US and further east and, and it was felt that Europe needed to be able to put together something together, not, not least because they couldn't afford it for any individual country. So they put a proposal together to have a lab and it was decided to be hosted in Geneva, which was probably maybe politically wise. It was a neutral territory, it was beautiful area. <laughs> With the help of you know, people like Niels Bohr and Louis de Broglie, major, major pioneers of quantum mechanics, they have developed, started the, the plan and it began with a cyclotron being built and then that moved on in the 1950s to have a proton synchrotron being built and that's still being used today. Then it sort of developed a bit more and as part of the feed-in rings to the LHC they developed a super proton synchrotron. In that they found that's where the W and Z particles were first discovered, uh, firing protons and antiprotons around that ring. So in the 1970s they had the, the LEP being built with their high precision experiments that were able to uncover the fundamental properties of the W and Z. This is where the Nobel Prize was uh, awarded for work done here uh, at the SPS. Uh, the first evidence was in that tube there that's now in this uh, little museum, this little science park where children probably run up and down it. <laughs> Gargamel, named after Rabelais' legendary giant, wife of Gargantua. Uh, yeah, that's the first evidence for what, what are known as neutral currents, uh, which uh, um, uh, were postulated as, as being, that would exist because of the presence of the Z particle. And they've also got the Nobel Prize uh, in 1992 for work of someone called George Charpak, who'd come up with a new class of detectors which went beyond the usual bubble chambers and taking photographs of particles interacting with fluids and leaving uh, scintillations of light. He, w he came up with a multi-grid detector, multi-wire detector, which uh, has tr transformed the world of particle physics. They're way more sensitive than anything else that has been designed. What does CERN stand for? CERN stands for the, it's a, it doesn't stand for anything as C-E-R-N, it's the um, I've forgotten what the exact Central European Research Central European Nuclear Research Establishment I think is what it's it's there for that's what its uh, meaning is but it it's just called CERN it, it's the words sort of go the other way around they don't go C E R N <laughs> CERN is the only place I mean there was a place in America that's still there uh, Fermilab is 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 like the um, the equivalent uh, place where they do p particle collisions but this is the main place where you can come and do fundamental physics where you've got the facilities the energy scales that you require you've got the manpower to actually do the work do the uh, experiments analyze the data and start analyzing the data there are over on each of these experiments there are something like 3,000 physicists involved so they're not all here at the same time of course a cafeteria would be a nightmare if that was the case but at any one time, there are hundreds of physicists from something like two, 200 countries throughout the world. One of the things I find staggering about CERN is that um, 
is the variety of countries. You know, there are people working on, coll collaborating together on experiments from Palestine, from Iran and from Israel. Where else do you get that? The one thing a lot of people seem to know about CERN is they invented the internet. Yeah. But then a lot of people say, no, they didn't, the US Army did. Talk to me about that. So Tim Berners-Lee, who's uh, in the particle physics world, is given the credit of, of coming up with the uh, World Wide Web, was working here. He, he was working sort of with the computing s section, and he realised that you know, one of the massive problems you have is how do you communicate all your results to, to other, just other people in the collaboration. Imagine you, there's 3,000 people working on this experiment. Maybe you want to share the results so that they can all begin to analyse the data. How do you do that when they're all over the world? And he came up with a technique, you know, you can't just store it in one computer and, and everyone try and access that one computer. And he came up with an idea, which was to have, a, a if you like, a distributed network so that the, the data could be distributed around and everyone to various computers and, and making it a lot easier then for people to access it. And he put forward this proposal and his boss, it's quite neat, his boss said, um, I, I've forgotten, he, he, he said something like, it's very ambitious but I like the idea. And he gave the go-ahead for him to carry on doing this investigation and, he, and basically Tim Berners-Lee developed a framework, a, a, that would allow, that led to the, the World Wide Web developing. It was, of course, something analogous was being thought up in lots of places, you know, the military, as you say, in the, in the US, lots of places doing it. But one of the key things that people forget about, the, about CERN's involvement in the World Wide Web, which I think is crucial to everybody watching it, CERN decided they were going to make this publicly available to everyone. And they put it in the public domain, and that immediately meant everyone could use it. And uh, so there's no cost to people to now be able to use the World Wide Web and that's thanks to CERN. To what extent is this just a, this, is it the Large Hadron Collider and to what extent are all these other things going on or are they all just little spin-offs of the LHC? Does the LHC dominate all here or? It seems pretty clear in terms of manpower the LHC dominates, you know, the Atlas experiment um, has 3,000 people working on it, I think CMS has nearly 3,000, 2,000 something. Two, two and a half thousand LHCB, two, over 2,000 people working on nearly 2,000 working on it. They're, these are large numbers of people, but that's not the only things going on, and, and they don't rely on the LHC um, for their existence. You know, one of the most famous, for example, is the anti hydrogen experiment, and that, when it's, it's already causing real ripples in the world of particle physics, you know, this the fact that they've not only managed to make anti-hydrogen, which they did a few years ago, but now they can store many atoms of anti-hydrogen for a long period of time. You've also got the neutrino experiments, of course, that uh, are where the neutrino beams end up in opera, but they're created here at, uh, at, the, at CERN uh, through the protons uh, that come out of the SPS accelerator. That doesn't rely on the LHC, but they've created here. And then we've got a number of other experiments going on that are looking at different aspects of particle physics and uh, testing different things to do with matter and antimatter asymmetry, uh, possible experiments searching for evidence of new physics in beyond the standard model that go beyond the LHC. I mean, the buildings that, that people work in, are they could do with a, t a lick of paint here and there, at least the theorists who work in these buildings over here. They're um, busy calculating where, I mean, the offices are fine, of course, once you're in there and the facilities are fine, but uh, it's true, compared to probably what we'll see in terms of the detectors tomorrow, they, 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 uh, they look a bit uh, worse, for, worse for wear. It's primarily a, a lab, and, and so, and it's primarily doing particle physics, and so if you are a particle experimentalist, you come here, if you can. You, you, this is where the, the experiments are, whether you're dealing with Alice, which I forgot to mention, by the way. You know, Alice is the key ion experiment that's going to test the quark uh, 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 plasma idea, um, quark hadron phase transition. So, just, for, just happened to forget it, sorry. <laughs> but there it is. I mean, there's just so much. If you're a particle experimentalist, this is the place to be. If you're a theorist, it is a brilliant place to be because you can talk directly with the experimentalist. But if you're a cosmologist, then you know it's great because you're studying early universe physics, but you don't have to be here all the time. You can, you can be at your, at your home institution. You turned down a job here. 
I wasn't actually offered it uh, in the end, but I uh, had a, a distinct chance of. Uh, the, I was approached about taking up a six-year position here. Yeah. No regrets. <laughs> no, no regrets. No, my, my life's done all right. <laughs>